Welcome back to part two of our summary of a 2018 Harvard University lecture delivered by Australian microbiologist and climate scientist Walter Jenner. In part one we discovered how nature's evolutionary systems over hundreds of millions of years converted large parts of the surface of our rocky planet into a spongy absorbent substrate that we now call soil. That soil allowed plant life to proliferate all over our planet and the photosynthesis of those plants drew vast quantities of carbon dioxide down from our planet's early atmosphere. We also discovered how deficiencies in our human agricultural processes have massively degraded that soil and released large amounts of carbon back up into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And we also learned that Walter Jenner is promoting an alternative system that he calls the soil carbon sponge, which he tells us is as simple as ABC, where A represents agriculture, B represents the burning of carbon, and C represents the fixing of carbon into our soils. According to Walter, our future literally depends on the BC ratio. In other words, how much carbon we burn and oxidize back into CO2 in the atmosphere, and how much carbon we fix into the soil to maintain a healthy material for future growth. Fixing the carbon in the soil is key to the success of regenerative agriculture. Left alone, the roots and root exudates will convert into humates which contain powerful natural acids that maximize the composting process and promote fungal growth. And we know from part one of this video that in a healthy soil, there's 25,000 kilometers of fungal tentacles called hyphae in every cubic meter, helping to fix the carbon in and also to stabilize nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil. As the fungi move on, they leave behind something called glomalin. Humates and glomalin then combine together to effectively create the glue that aggregates the soil and creates the springy detritus between the soil particles, keeping the soil spongy and absorbent. So as usual, nature's already formulated a perfect strategy underground to fix the carbon and keep all those nutrients cycling around the system really fast. But what about the carbon content in the stubble and litter that gets left on top of the ground? Well, Walter Jenner argues that this is where ruminant animals play a crucial role. Jenner maintains that the grasslands that evolved 50 million years ago existed only as a result of a symbiotic relationship with herbivores. The herbivores got to eat the grass, and in doing so, they broke up the surface soil, spread seeds around, and distributed their own brand of natural organic fertilizer on the land. Then they moved on and did the same thing somewhere else, allowing the grassland they left behind to benefit fully from their activity before the herd returned to that particular patch later in the season, or perhaps even the following year. Without that interaction, Jenner argues, the grasslands would have turned quickly to desert and all the carbon stored in the soil would have been released back into the atmosphere as CO2. Regenerative agriculture mimics this symbiotic relationship by actively moving herds of animals from one area of land to another, allowing them to graze the grass, trample the ground, break up the surface and distribute their waste products before being moved onto the next zone. And this can be done several times a day. It's extremely labor intensive for the farmers but they understand the benefits that the system brings. But hang on a minute, aren't we constantly being told that ruminant animals produce methane, and methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, right? Well, of course, the answer to that is yes. But Walter Jenner explains that in a healthy ecosystem like the ones that regenerative agriculture is recreating, nature's already got a balancing mechanism for that in place as well. Healthy green grassland produces water vapor through the process of transpiration. As sunlight hits water vapor, it photooxidizes it, and one of the products is hydroxyl ions. Hydroxyl ions are very aggressive and reactive, so when they come into contact with the methane gas produced by the ruminant animals, they break that methane down into CO2 and water. Jenna suggests that a healthy green pasture will produce about a hundred times the hydroxyl ions needed to break down the methane that the herbivores grazing that land have the potential to produce. It's important to point out here that what Walter Jenner's talking about is completely different to the industrial mega farms that churn out animals for the beef industry in huge intensive dust bowls, feeding the livestock on starchy cereal crops like soy to maximize the bulk of the animal before slaughter with the sole focus being optimization of throughput and maximization of profits 
with no thought whatsoever to the sustainability of soil, environment or climate. The starchy food that those animals are forced to eat causes them to produce far higher levels of methane and they don't graze healthy green pasture so there's little transpiration to cancel this methane out. There are more than 1.4 billion cattle in the world today, the majority of which are farmed in this intensive way, producing methane that's equivalent to 2 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year, or 40% of the global methane budget. It's an industrial system that's completely unsustainable and rapidly destroying vast tracts of otherwise fertile land and forestry area. In stark contrast, there are significant dividends to be had from Walter Jenner's soil carbon sponge system and regenerative agriculture, not just for the landowner, but for the climate and environment as well. According to Jenner's data, the 1,000 or so Australian farmers currently participating in the Healthy Soil Australia program are apparently achieving 100% of the crop yield with 300% the quality and nutritional integrity of the food grains with less than 20% of the inputs less than 10% of the risk, 300% the reliability, and 500% the natural land capital and soil regeneration value. And from a climate point of view, because the soil is healthy, spongy and wet, the process of transpiration effectively creates a heat cycle. Every gram of water leaving the soil through transpiration needs 590 calories of energy to change state from water to gas. That's just the basic physics of latent heat of vaporization. That energy comes from the surface of the soil, so the surface can only cool as a result. The vapor carries the energy up into the atmosphere, where it condenses back into micro droplets of water, releasing the heat energy to continue on into space. So heat is being constantly conveyed away from the surface of the earth through this process. About 24% of the 342 watts per square meter of energy currently reaching Earth is taken back up into space by these latent heat fluxes, and that's about 85 watts per square meter. So Jenner argues that just a 5% increase in the global area of healthy green pasture would offset the 3 watts per square meter of deficit that we're currently experiencing. Eventually, this water falls back to Earth as rain to replenish the soil, and the cycle of transpiration and condensation continues. But it takes a million microdroplets to form a single raindrop, and before that happens, the microdroplets form dense clouds. At any given time, about 50% of the surface of the Earth is covered in cloud, and the albedo effect of the white cloud surface reflects back into space about 120 watts per square meter of the 342 watts per square meter of energy that arrives in our atmosphere. So Jen is suggesting that if the extra transpiration and condensation from the extra area of healthy green pasture produce just a 2% increase in global cloud cover, that would offset another 3 watts per square meter of the incoming solar energy and potentially achieve the cooling effect that we require to reach our short-term climate mitigation goals. Land with healthy green plant and grass cover and daily transpiration processes has soil beneath it that typically rarely gets above 20 degrees Celsius. This is in contrast to bare barren land that can have soil temperatures as high as 60 degrees Celsius. That's already a big difference in temperature, but Jenner points us to something called the Stefan Boltzmann equation, which states that re-radiation from a black body like the Earth is proportional not just to the temperature, but to temperature to the power of four. In other words, temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature. So the radiation from land at 60 degrees Celsius is massively higher than land at 20 degrees Celsius. Essentially, there are three main factors that cause the greenhouse effect. The first is how much re-radiation occurs in the first place. The second is how much of that re-radiation is absorbed by water vapor molecules. And the third is how much of that re-radiation is absorbed by carbon dioxide molecules. Walter Jenner maintains that all climate models completely ignore the first factor, the re-radiation, and re-radiation is governed largely by land management, and land management is dominated by human agricultural practices. And he reminds us that water vapor accounts for 90% of the overall greenhouse effect that naturally regulates the planet's temperature. So a relatively tiny change in this variable can bring about a relatively large change in that temperature. But he also makes the very important point that despite all its beneficial effects, 
regenerative agriculture shouldn't be seen as a reason to reduce the urgency with which we're pursuing a wholesale reduction in fossil fuels and all the other climate mitigation practices like renewable energy. We need to keep carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and into our soils as much as we possibly can, says Jenna. And if we can succeed in doing that, then we're probably going to go a long way towards achieving our very urgent short-term climate mitigation goals. That's it for this two-parter. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the program useful and informative. And you can really support the growth of the channel by subscribing and hitting the little bell icon so that you get notified of when the new programs come out each week. Subscriptions and views are the lifeblood of all YouTube channels. It's how we get noticed by the YouTube search algorithms so that more and more people can hear the messages that we put out. It's completely free and dead easy to subscribe. All you need to do is click on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.